after Ghazali, whoever sees him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in dream, does not have in mind a vision of the reality of his person interred in the garden at Medina, Rauda, but rather an imaginal body, Nizar. We should remind ourselves that in normative Sunni doctrine, credence was given to the conviction that God's messenger Muhammad was alive and possessed of consciousness in his tomb in the Garden of Medina. Suyuti himself wrote a book specifically supporting this certainty. Until 1924, when the unruly rabble of Ibn Saud's Ikhwan destroyed the building of the Prophet's tomb, the Hasanid Sharifs entrusted over the Haramain had carried out the annual ritual sweeping of the interior of this tomb, whose collected dust was deemed of the utmost holiness and possession of even a tiny amount highly prized. But the pious individual assigned this awesome task did so in great trepidation, fearful of deadly consequences if he unduly disturbed the prophet at his prayers. Let us now move from the Sunni imaginative appropriation of this symbolic narrative to the Shia. Thank God, Professor Shahram Hazuki has already introduced some aspects of the Shia imagination, and I will count on his introduction. Here we plunge into a plethora of statements assigned to their imams, amplifying the concept of imaginal body that we so casually have just skimmed, but with a significant difference. The utterances of the Imams were first and foremost directed at reinforcing the rights of Ahl al-Bayt for governance of Islam and at magnifying their spiritual and epistemological superiority of their founding hero, Ali, son of Abu Talib. May God dignify his visage. Certain single-minded features of Imam Shia Hadith become more understandable once this bias is taken into account. For example, the class of traditions portraying the angelic phantom likeness of Ali in heaven, which Muhammad is surprised to meet during his ascension. Ja'far al-Sadiq described how after death, the faithful are raised from the grave accompanied by the figure of a beautiful shade, Mithal, as a visualization of one's good deeds to comfort and to fortify the soul. When the faithful asks, who are you? The figure replies, I am the happiness that you brought upon your brother in faith, in worldly life. God created me to bring you good tidings. Sadiq explains, the act of righteousness proceeds to paradise to prepare a resting place for its owner, just as someone sends his servant ahead of him to arrange his bedding. Of course, this is an old Zoroastrian motif now which resurfaces in Islamic tradition. Muhammad al-Baqir, the father of Jafar al-Sadiq, informed one of his disciples that the Prophet was unique to denote the spiritual pre-existence of the Prophet and his family before the physical creation of the universe or of any being possessed of spirit. In this utterance by Ja'far al-Sadiq in reply to the question of his disciple al Mufaddal, how were you, plural, when you were amidst the shades, fil adilla? The Imam states, we were with our Lord, there was no one with him except us in a green shade or green cloud, Fidillatin Khadra, singing his praise and glorifying him and acclaiming his oneness, and we were the only living spirits. Sadiq asserts at the time of the pre creation covenant, Mithat, that God made with humans, that people were in the prenatal form of the Adilla, Qabl al Milad. Before all else, God was alone eternally as a supernal light. And Sadiq states, Then God blessed and exalted love to create creatures who would extol his sublimity and magnify his grandeur and exalt his splendor. So he said, Let there be two shades, Kunna Dillaini. And the two came to be just as God blessed and exalted and said. The interpretation of which two are meant the narrator Ibn Babuway himself interprets them as the Ruh al Qudus and the Malak Muqarrid, the sanctified spirit and the near angel. However, the editor of this text, Kitab al Tawheed, has in a footnote identified them with Muhammad and Ali in tune with the later Imami metaphysics colored by Ibn Arabi and conceptions and other teachings. 
There is an enigmatic utterance described in Jafar al-Sadr in which he defines Tawheed, God's oneness. Wahidun samadun azaliyun samadiyun la dhilla lahu yamsikuhu wa huwa yumsiku al-ashya'i adillatiha. One, everlasting, eternally beginningless and endless, he has no shade adhering to him, while he grasps all things by their shades. This is not easy to understand, but it invites us to a closer look at the term dhil, shade, and related conceptions of khayal, phantom apparition, as well as mithal, image of form. I won't uh, go into the details, I had some linguistic data, a well-known image of the pre-Islamic poets singing about their khayal, the uh, image of their beloved, absent beloved, who they evoke in their memory and converse with in their poetry. But there is one poem I'd like to recite here, described to Al-Abbas ibn Abd al-Muttalib, the uncle of the Prophet Muhammad, who in praise of his nephew. Min qabliha tibta fi dhilali wa fi mustawda'in haythu yukhsafu al-waraku. Before it, you delighted in the shades of paradise and in a depository in the part where leaves are sewed together to conceal the pudenda. It's a little Victorian English translation by Edward Lane. And exactly how to understand the lines here, we might transpose the meaning in line with the notion of a person's shakhas, the corporeal like figure visible from a distance, namely the darkness of shape like a shadow, synonymous with the data, something as follows. Before being in the earth, in your terrestrial body, you delighted within the shades, phantom figures, and in the depository of your ancestor's loins. We should recall an old association of dhil or dhilada with a prenatal spermatic existence. And this notion was conjoined with the Quranic terminology of nur and ruh, light and spirit, as evidenced in early Shia hadith about anthroposophy, treating primordial matter, tina, clay, and sperm drop, lutfa. But we won't get into that here. Now, it is true that primordial matter and the motif of pre-creation shadow figures, adilla, or imaginal forms, mithad, is often viewed as characteristic of radical Kufan extremist teachings, which fed into emerging imami Shiite doctrine. However, it is also likely that the term adilla may be traced to old Arab, even pre-Islamic usage, involving a vague notion of pre-existence in the most ancient time, a mode of existence where entities possess some degree of bodily shape or figure, but not physical life. Let us return now to Al-Ghazal, who taught a specific doctrine of five levels of modes of existence or presence, barat al wujud this teaching lay at the basis of his theory of ta'wil, or levels of inner significances, enabling him to reconcile seemingly contradictory disciplines or opposing doctrinal views. These five realms of cognitive prehension are zati, essential, hissi, sensory, khayali, imaginal, akli, conceptual, and shibhi, analogous. It's not a very good translation, but uh, gives an idea. In between the sensory realm, situated in the Alam al-Mulk, and the conceptual realm, situated in Alam al-Malakud, lies the imaginal realm, situated in Alam al-Jabarud. For example, the conceptual level operates at the level of conceptual existence, wujud al-Akli, when something has a spirit, and a reality, and a meaning, ruh, haqiqa, ma'na then the intellect obtains its sheer conceptual meaning without establishing its form in imaginal or sensory or external existence. The two main sources for Ghazali's notion on this is Faisal al-Tafriqa, in Islam al-Zantaka, and his Al-Imla al-Ishkalat al-Ihya, usually appended to the Ihya al 